Stargate, a novel by Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich. Chapter 21, The Trojan Horse. Standard procedure on shipment days called for every able-bodied person in Nagata to come to the pit. They worked for two or three easy hours, no one climbing the eleven-story ladder more than twice. When the carts were loaded, a small contingent brought the ore to the pyramid and sent it through the stargate. By the early evening when they returned, the city was ready to celebrate the feast of Tekfalit, marking the end of the forty-day work cycle. Prayers and songs thanking Ra for all he provided were followed by an outdoor feast. Celebrants moved from house to house, offering and receiving food and drink. This was the only day of the month to drink the delicious taba, a sweet liqueur brewed from fermented desert shrubs that, when ingested in sufficient quantities, produced states of intoxication. The Nagadans made sure to ingest the necessary quantities. By midnight, half the town was ripped to the gills, and the party in the streets routinely lasted into the next morning. But today was no ordinary tekfalit. Ra had been anticipating the moves of his human subjects for thousands of years. Although he could be rash, he also knew how to be careful. Less than a thousand workers had been permitted to enter, and they were being driven zealously up and down the ladder, by Ra's most sadistic henchmen. But it wasn't physical fear of the guard that made the workers obey. It was because they believed the myths they had been told since birth. That was why Ra needed so few guards to shepherd so many workers. Strapped to his back was the tall staff weapon, but his tool of choice was the leather whip. He lashed at the Felahin almost continuously eager to bring the shipment to his master as quickly as possible. A few of the older workers had already collapsed under the strain, but they had done so well away from the sharp eyes of the hawk-helmeted guard. High above on the cliffs, ready to march in the direction of the pyramid, four stately mastages stood tethered to four-wheeled cargo carts. Each of the hairy animals had been painstakingly washed and groomed, decorated with ornate prayer shawls, small bells, and long braided garlands of dried desert flowers. The rickety wooden carts behind them each carried about a ton of quartz, and with the workers dumping the ore by the sackful, were nearly full and ready to move. By tradition, the first cart was filled only with the largest nuggets, normally no larger than walnuts. The last cart, the heaviest, was filled with quartz powder. Spread around the dusty floor of the pit were half a dozen processing pavilions. These workstations were marked by a small obelisk rising through the canvas roof of a large tent. This is where the raw quartz was sifted, sorted according to size and purity, then cleaned. Everything was saved down to the last granulated shavings, which were blended with other materials to produce valuable alloys. Loading their sacks full with the mineral, the Felahin carried them across the hot sand to the base of the giant ladders, running like a scar up the side of the cliff. Climbing these ladders was no easy feat. Climbing them with one hundred pounds of dead weight on your back in one hundred degree heat was not only tiring, it was dangerous. Since the great majority of the Nagadans had been forced to turn around and march home, those who were working had to make many trips up the wall. Eventually, one of the laborers wilted and collapsed near where the Horus guard had stationed himself. He had been waiting his turn at the base of the ladder when he apparently succumbed to heat exhaustion. Several nearby workers tried to help him regain his feet, but before they could do so, Horus was jogging toward them, screaming for the man to get up and work. When he came within striking distance, the powerfully built young man used his whip to put a stripe across the back of the fallen worker, cutting right through the thick material of his robe. The man tried to stand, but slumped once more into the sand, sending Horus into a rage. The hawk-headed god unsheathed a serrated dagger, ready to teach the others a gruesome lesson. 
But, at the last second, the miner flipped nimbly onto his back, showing Horace the business end of a pulse rifle, the very weapon Ra had handed to Daniel. Horace, frozen, stared at the exhausted worker, Colonel Jack O'Neill of the USMC. Staring right back, O'Neill methodically cocked the weapon open and hopped to his feet. At the same time, several of the surrounding miners pulled rifles from beneath their robes and trained them on Horace. Slowly, his fingers loosened around the whip handle, and he let it drop to the ground. Kowalski moved behind him and took the pulse rifle off his back. Kasuf's voice came piercing down from the top of the cliff towering above them. Horrified, he came running along the lip of the ravine toward the scene of the confrontation. When he understood what was happening, he flew into an absolute panic, pointing and screaming. Hundreds of surprised miners began slowly surrounding the ragtag commando squad and their prisoner, obviously confused about what to do. Whatever the old man was saying, it was working. O'Neill saw Shauri, Skara, and the other amateurs in the group looking up toward the man, listening. He knew the old man was trying to scare everyone back into obedience. Something had to be done quickly. Jackson, O'Neill yelled. What's he saying? Daniel listened for a minute, then tried to interpret Kasuf's apoplectic rantings. He's saying we're to bring misery to his people. A massacre. That Ra will slaughter everyone who disobeys and... Now he's telling them not to cooperate with us, not to anger the gods. Don't anger the gods, huh? O'Neill looked at Horace with contempt. Casually, he paced off the short distance between them and peered into the golden screen at the throat of the large hawk mask. He was standing face to face with the dreaded invincible deity and wasn't at all impressed. All attention was once again riveted on him. Then, just as nonchalantly as he had approached, O'Neill turned his back on the hawk-headed soldier, standing well within his reach. He knew his men would take the man out if he tried anything. O'Neill shook his head in a display of non-comprehension. This guy ain't no god. He turned, pointing his rifle at Horace's chest, and pulled the trigger. The blast hit the warrior square on his armored chestplate, knocking him backward like he'd collided with a truck. He landed in a heap several feet away. Nia! Kasuf screamed out like he was the one who had been shot. The scream modulated into a long plaintive wail spilling into the long, human-made valley. Kowalski, O'Neill, and Brown, not knowing what to expect next, concentrated on covering the crowd with their rifles. No one on the floor of the pit could believe what O'Neill had just done. Only a few days before, they had felt the consequences of Ra's anger, cowered helplessly as their city was hacked apart and burned for a crime much less severe than this. And now, this violent miracle, this impossible, unimaginable crime, had taken place without warning right before their eyes. A few of the miners immediately fell to their knees, and, following Kasuf's example, broke into ardent prayer. But most were too stunned, too confused by what they had witnessed to react at all. O'Neill was on the warpath now. He turned to his troops and boomed out his command. Okay, let's get to the carts, now. The very next moment he was leading the way, crashing through the crowd toward the base of the cliffs. Daniel knew something wasn't right. Lagging behind the others, he looked into the faces of the astonished populace. Frightened and utterly confused, they avoided his glance. He could see that they didn't understand what had happened. Without quite knowing why, he knew it was imperative for them to understand that the killing was an act of tyrannicide. Wait a second, he called forward. He ran over to the helmeted villain's limp body and twisted the connecting tabs at the base of the helmet. The elaborately decorated metallic plates silently retracted, folding themselves back into the golden collar at the top of his breastplate. 
Beneath the mask was the unremarkable face of Ra's darkest-skinned warrior, the bald-headed young man who supervised the slaughter of Nagata. Except for his armor and the Udyat, the eye of Ra design, tattooed on his shoulder, he looked like he could have belonged to any family in the ancient city. Daniel hoisted him up to a sitting position, displaying him to the assembled miners. Take a look at your gods, he shouted in Egyptian loud enough to be heard over Kasuf's song. He is a man like any other. Soon, both Kasuf and Daniel were drowned out by the excited chatter spreading like a brush fire through the ranks of the workers. It was an amazing moment. Daniel watched as the veils of illusion fell away from the eyes of these downtrodden people. With a certain amount of showmanship, Daniel shoved the slack body forward into the dirt. He picked up the pulse rifle Kowalski had given him and moved to rejoin the squad. Most of the Nagadans were now firmly on his side. As he passed, many offered words of congratulation or encouragement. Buoyed, Daniel sauntered with an extra bounce in his step. He felt he'd handled the situation pretty damn well. He spotted his beautiful showery beaming down at him proudly. Her expression quickly changed to one of horror as she looked again in the direction of Horus. Sudden cries from the crowd alerted him to an approaching danger. O'Neill's shot had hit nothing but armor. It had knocked the man unconscious, but now he had come around and woozily grabbed one of the mining tools, a pickaxe from the ground. By the time Daniel wheeled around, the warrior was rearing back with the axe, ready to chop. Without time to think, Daniel pointed his weapon and fired. It was only the second time in his life he'd pulled a trigger. But his shot hit exactly where it needed to, beneath the armored breastplate, and ripped into the soldier's unprotected stomach. The pulse sent him pinwheeling backward through the air. The gruesome flight ended with his head finding the corner of a retaining wall. Even the professional soldiers grimaced at the moment of impact. If the crowd was stunned before, now they were positively stupefied. But none more so than Daniel, who stood with the gun quaking in his hands. Not so easy, is it? O'Neill had scrambled down the ladder and was easing the rifle out of the shaken scholar's hands. It was Nabe's idea to replace the lead animal in the delivery train with the filthy, slobbering beast that saved Daniel and O'Neill from the sandstorm, an act of heroism that had earned her a place on the team. Using the bangles and garlands from the lead animal, the boys did what they could to improve the looks of her decidedly uglier friend before harnessing him to the front cart. As soon as O'Neill made the top of the ladder, he shouted the order for the caravan to head out. Skara relayed the order to the other shepherd boys. With whoops and shouts, they spurred the mastages into action. Although the carts were piled high with the heavy ore, the powerful beasts pulled them with surprising ease. O'Neill had been expecting a slow trudge across the sand, but found he had to jog along behind the last cart to keep up. In the shadow of the obelisks, Daniel saw an irate Kasuf holding Shauri by the sleeve of her thick gray robe. He was obviously berating her for taking part in what he considered an act of suicidal madness. Kowalski raced ahead to join the caravan, but Daniel lingered, watching the scene with mixed emotion. Shauri was an integral part of the plan she had helped to design. The team needed her. On the other hand, it was incredibly dangerous. Chances were that they would all be killed, a fact the shepherd boys seemed not to understand. Daniel was willing to take the risk because he wanted to protect the earth from Ra. But why should Shauri risk her life for the good of a planet she hadn't even imagined a month before? As Kasuf continued to shout, the girl was visibly torn. Trained to be blindly obedient, especially to this man who was not only her father, but the chief elder and patriarch of her people, she felt immobilized, her feet frozen to the spot. When she looked up and saw Daniel, 
she gained the courage to try and explain why she had to go to the pyramid. But this only incensed the old one further. Since before Shaori was born, Kasuf had preached unquestioning servility to Ra, shepherding his flock away from conflicts they were bound to lose. He was among the very few who knew the whole secret history of Nagata's ancient rebellions, and he knew how painfully each of the uprisings had ended. His people thought they had tasted Ra's full vengeance when the Horuses came to punish the city, but the old man knew better. He understood how venomously cold-blooded the sun god could be. To Kasuf, it felt like the end of the world, the sky shattering and crashing down around him, and at that moment... Shaori seemed like the only part of the world he could control. He wouldn't allow this ignorant young woman to tell him how to behave toward his unforgiving god. Shaori! When she heard Daniel call her name, the decision was made once and for all. Slowly and deliberately, she twisted her arm free of Kasuf's grip. After all, she was physically stronger than he. Kasuf stepped back, aghast at this act of insubordination. Without rancor, Shari said it was better to die on your feet than live on your knees. It was a hard thing to say to the old man she loved so much, and then ran to catch up with Daniel. As she came toward him, Daniel suddenly remembered the formula for power Ra had blithely explained to him. Myth, faith, habit. The people in the mining pit who had witnessed the confrontation, and then the execution, had seen a crucial part of Ra's false governing, myth, the immortality of the gods, exposed as a sham. But looking back at Kasuf, Daniel realized that habit, once it was established, would always be the last of the three to die. Ra sat draped sideways across a chair, staring blankly out the great window of his pyramid craft at the endless, empty desert. He was idly stroking the black cat lying across his arm. He called the cat Hathor in honor of the female god who had once saved his fiefdom by drowning it in the blood of the rebels. Conflicting versions of the story reached Earth a few years before the Stargate was sealed and buried for all time. Recorded by scribes on papyrus and carved into stone by masons, Daniel knew the story well, but had always considered it merely another episode in Egyptian mythology. The boy king, bareheaded and his skin showing its natural brown color, spotted the caravan crawling across the barren sea of sand. He stood and watched for a few moments. Nothing distinguished this caravan from the countless others he'd observed. Still... Something about the scene brought the barest smile to his lips. He realized that he was glad the fair-skinned one with the glasses had escaped. It made everything more interesting. There was even the possibility that he was part of the delivery team, disguised, no doubt, as one of the Felahim. Swaying back and forth ever so slightly, Ra fell into a daydream. When he emerged from it several minutes later, his mood was completely different. He shouted a command, and a moment later two of the Horus guards were kneeling before him, awaiting their orders with heads hung low. He told the nearly identical soldiers to transport the tray with the captured American weapon to the Stargate room before going to meet the shipment. When the shipment was sent through, the bomb would be set to go off and sent along with it. Like a pair of waiters at an unappetizing banquet, they marched the length of the throne room, balancing the large platter, laden with the disassembled nuclear explosive. They marched the length of the throne room and stepped onto the medallion, wrapped in the black arms of Knum. Ra looked at Anubis and raised his eyebrows ever so slightly, obviously expecting something. It was a sadistic game Ra played with his servants when he was angry or bored, forcing them to guess what he wanted. Guessing wrong could, and often did, lead to brutal, painful punishment. In this case, Anubis had enough information. 
Anubis pressed the jewel mounted in the scarab on the back of his thick quartz and iron wristband, activating the medallion. When the circular wall of cloudy blue light enclosed the horses and their cargo, they were gently ferried down to the medallion below. Young Skara was in charge of the operation now. During the long march through the arid desert, O'Neill and the boy rode atop the piles of quartz locked in an intense discussion of strategy that went well beyond the skill of their interpreter, Daniel. After teaching them some basic vocabulary, Daniel could only stand by and listen as the two of them sped through one idea after the next. With gestures, pantomime, and twenty-five words in common, the man and the boy pored over every detail of the plan, occasionally breaking out of their huddle to explain a new wrinkle to the others. Long before they reached the pyramid's entrance ramp, they assumed they were being watched. There was a strict protocol to be observed before the delivery could be brought into the pyramid. The religious people of Nagata were, of course, scrupulous about practicing these rites, even when the pyramid was empty. Skara had participated in many deliveries, and, as Kosuf's youngest son, had even led the ceremony before. But this he would be doing so under Ra's scrutiny, while accompanied by the four uninitiated visitors. Anything wrong or unusual would arouse suspicion. When they were assembled at the base of the long ramp, Skara knelt down between the obelisks and sang in a strong, clear voice, Ateman re halam anatyan shaknam asaratem re. Meaning, Ra, who comes from the sun, we now submit gratefully the results of our labor, holy sun god Ra. When he was finished, he stood and looked at Nabe for an opinion. His eccentric friend shrugged in return as if to say the song had been good enough. What is that? Skara noticed something under Nabe's haik. What is what? He tried to act innocent. Under your haik? It's the green hat, isn't it? Nabe didn't know what to say, so he grinned nervously. Everyone had told him he couldn't bring the helmet, but he didn't want to leave it back in the cave. He could tell from the way Skara was talking to him that he'd made a big mistake. The next moment... Nabe's eyes filled with dread as he looked past Skara's shoulder to the pyramid entrance. Three Horus warriors stepped onto the platform at the top of the ramp, each of them holding one of the deadly staffs. Paralyzed, Skara spent a moment visualizing what would happen to them all if these guards discovered Nabe's beloved polyurethane treasure. Not knowing exactly what to do next, Skara ordered the delivery crew all of them wearing their hoods pulled low over their faces, to kneel in respect to the gods. After what seemed to him an appropriate amount of time, Skara stood and unharnessed Daniel's mastage, little bit, pulling her aside and handing the reins to Nabe, speaking angrily under his breath. If they find the hat, they will kill us! Nabe didn't quite realize that the helmet would implicate him in the wild escape Shaori and the boys had engineered. Heavy rope handles hung from the sides of the carts. At Skara's signal, the hooded workers assigned to the first cart came forward, grabbed onto the ropes, and slowly began to drag the vehicle up the incline. As it moved away, an unexpected problem reared its ugly, oleaginous head. Daniel's mastage, jealous, began to moan, and then to bellow. Nabe spoke to the dressed-up beast, trying desperately to quiet him down. But no matter what the boy threatened, the animal refused to stop blubbering. Frightened, fearful of being discovered, none of the hooded workers turned to look back at the animal. A curious bit of behavior. For all, shouted the lead Horus, carefully eyeing the workers at the lead cart. Hasimni Khan Suf! Without hesitation, all the workers held their hands straight out in front of them. Still suspicious, the hawk-headed warrior came several steps down the ramp, staring straight at Nabe, who was engaged in a nose-to-nose -nose discussion with the unruly mastage. He had calmed the animal and was facing away from the ramp, 
but was still attracting too much attention to himself. Skara felt sure the Horace was about to order his friend to turn around, and then all would be lost. The Horace came a few yards down the ramp, suspicious, but eventually returned his attention to the first cart, where the six workers stood stiffly looking forward. Their heads bowed. He toured the cart for a moment before waving it through, past the other helmeted guards. When the armored soldier turned and marched back up the ramp, everyone breathed a huge sigh of relief. Skara stole a swift glance at Kowalski and Ferretti, standing barefoot alongside the hindmost vehicle. They peered back from beneath the hoods of their itchy, woolen hikes and nodded. As the first cart disappeared into the shadows of the entrance hall, the Mastage made one last attempt to communicate with Daniel. He erupted in an ear-splitting howl. The Chief Horus shot another look back at the animal and thought for a minute before hissing an order to the other two guards. They immediately turned and trotted inside while their apparent leader studied the reaction of those standing at the obelisks. Again, no one showed him any reaction. A moment later, he too followed the cart into the darkness. I knew this Trojan horse plan was no damn good, Freddy whispered to Kowalski, as anxious and fidgety as ever. Should we go in? It might still work, Kowalski replied. Inside, all three Horus figures surrounded the cart. The one in charge shouted an order, but no one moved. He stepped up to one of the laborers and yanked the hood back, revealing the terrified face of a red-headed young shepherd. He threw the boy to the floor and moved to the next person in line. He grabbed onto the hood and pulled it back. Shauri screamed as the man's powerful hand tore out a clump of hair. Taken off guard by the sight of a woman, the three hawks looked at one another. But that surprise was nothing compared to the one that came a split second later. Erupting out of the quartz pile, Daniel and O'Neill lifted their weapons, took aim, and began firing. At the same time, conventional guns flashed out from beneath the shepherd's hikes, and a wild volley of bullets sprayed into the vast hallway, ricocheting everywhere. Unfortunately, both Daniel and O'Neill had chosen the lead Horus as a target. The combined power of their shots had shredded the unarmored parts of the man's body, but left time for the other two to retreat into the shadows. The red-headed boy made a dash for the doorway. A fist-sized meteor from one of the pulse rifles flashed across the room and caught him squarely in the back of the head, killing him instantly. Daniel jumped into the no-man's land between the cart and the pillars, successfully pulling a pair of trigger-happy shepherds to safely behind the heavy tub of quartz. Go! Everyone inside! Kowalski led the charge up the ramp, moving at top speed. However, a door, a giant stone slab, started to drop down from above. Kowalski was fast, but not fast enough to make it inside before the monolith sealed the entrance. When he realized he'd never make it, he slowed to a trot and glanced over his shoulder. Nabe, legs churning like rubber bands, holding his helmet on his head with one hand, was trundling along at a surprising clip. Kowalski hesitated long enough for the boy to pull even with him. He reached up and snagged the helmet off Nabe's head, then flung it like a frisbee, skittering up the ramp just as the door was closing. Strike! The helmet wedged itself under the heavy stone block at precisely the right moment. Though slightly crushed, it held the door open a few inches off the ground. Break off some wood from the carts. We'll lever the door back open. Kowalski must have been dreaming. The slab must have weighed at least three or four tons. But Freddy didn't hesitate to sprint limp back down the ramp and join him in smashing five-foot planks of wood free from the sides of the transports. O'Neill was gone. He had been there one moment before firing at the horses, but when Daniel looked back, he had disappeared. Everything had gone dark and eerily quiet inside the entrance hall. A murky light sifted between the pillars, turning the chamber into a chessboard of light and dark. Daniel, clueless in the ways of warfare, felt momentarily safe. No bullets were flying, and he had Shauri by his side. He thought Ra's soldiers, outnumbered if not outgunned, might have fled the scene. Eventually, 
it occurred to him that the guards might be using this lull in the action to move to new positions. Suddenly realizing how exposed and vulnerable they were out in the middle of the wide hallway, he silently gathered the attention of the pathetic little battalion and signaled a retreat to the pillars behind them. Precisely the mistake Ra's soldiers were expecting them to make. They reassembled in the darkest spot they could find in the space between the pillars, but with the safety of the wall came the danger of the light from the windows. They were no longer invisible. Whispering her instructions, Shaori positioned the boys between the pillars, giving each of them responsibility for covering a different angle of approach. When they were in place, everyone held their breath and waited. Just as Daniel had imagined, the helmeted soldiers were on the move. A bright blade of sunlight was slicing through the gap kept open by Nabe's helmet. Stealthily, one of the Horus guards found the narrow ledge running along the bottom of the great door and stepped into it. Shuffling his feet carefully along the narrow outcropping, he moved toward the center of the room, only inches above the light. Although the raiding party was watching the area around the door carefully, the soldier, working with the home field advantage, had correctly calculated that the sliver of blinding light would make him invisible to anyone looking in that direction. He came to the end of the ledge and stepped off, silently making his way through the inky shadows to the first pillar, then advancing up the hallway. He leaned into the space between the pillars and the exterior wall. Catching sight of the team, one of the young shepherds was staring straight toward him, but the darkness kept him hidden. From his angle, Daniel's back was a wide-open target barely twenty yards away. Very slowly, he lifted his staff up to the firing position and took aim. Shaori, sensing something, checked behind them once more, the barest glimmer reflecting off the beveled quartz jewels set into the rifle. Her scream startled everyone, including the Horus. He pulled back on the weapon just enough to send the shot six inches over Daniel's head. He fired once more, but this time only to clear a path for his charge. He advanced all the way up to the pillar behind which the team was cowering. An arm's reach around the corner, Daniel thought he could taste the end of his life. Shaori had already pulled the last of the boys behind the next pillar. Keeping his back pressed to the stone pillar, eyes forward, every nerve in his body at full alert, he waited for the first sign of movement to come around one of the corners. Knowing his armor protected him, even from the powerful pulse rifle in the fair-skinned one's hands, the Horus slid forward head first. The second before he came around the corner, a shot rang out, striking him in the back of his helmet, throwing him across the floor like an empty garbage can into the shadows. By that point, Daniel was so wired, so pumped with adrenaline, he was having trouble breathing. One of the kids poked his head around the corner, and asked if Daniel was all right. Daniel didn't answer, didn't even look at the boy. He knew there was at least one more of the armored killers lurking in the dark. Perhaps there were many more, riding the medallion down from the pyramid-shaped craft above. Okay, on three. Kowalski looked at the boys. One... Two, three, lift! Ferretti and Kowalski jammed their shoulders against their planks of wood as the shepherds, working in pairs, did the same. The eight of them, hoisting together, were slowly lifting the door back up an inch at a time. When it was six inches above the top of the helmet, Kowalski felt his share of the weight suddenly increase. Skara had abandoned the lever he and Nabe were working and was attempting to shimmy his way under the door. No, not yet! The Herculean Kowalski, veins bulging in his forehead, looked down and saw Skara's head and shoulders disappear under the door. Get him out of there, damn it! Kowalski barked. As though he understood the command, Nabe dropped to his knees and reached under the door, returning a moment later with his battered treasure, the helmet. He shared the good news, showing the helmet to Kowalski. Put it back! We need that under there! Kowalski gestured with his chin. Put it back! Nabe either didn't understand what Kowalski wanted him to do, or pretended not to. 
He put the helmet back on his head, picked up his plank, and rejoined the effort to lift the door. Squinting into the darkness, Skara looked for his companions. He spotted a figure moving through the shadows. Skara let out a sharp, hollow whistle, a private signal they had used since childhood. Quickly, Shari rushed over to the remaining shepherd boys, telling them to make a run for the doorway. When the boys turned to see what Shari was talking about, they found an anxious Skara waving frantically for them. Nervously, the boys looked at each other, deciding who should go first. Finally, the first boy swallowed hard and jumped into the open, running as fast as he could for the door. As soon as he took off, the others were right behind him, bounding toward the exit like scared jackrabbits. Before Shari could even entertain the idea of trying to join them, she felt Daniel tug urgently on her arm. He had seen one of the sinister silhouettes hurry past on its way to the door. But before he could reach them, the last of the children escaped. Daniel and Shari pressed flat against the pillar as the horse guard turned back into the hall, his armor's soft rustling barely audible. The weight of the immense door seemed to be growing as Kowalski and Ferretti started to feel the fatigue. Although they and the boys were still lifting with the same amount of determination, the door began to sink, sliding down an inch at a time. Skara helped the last of the shepherds wriggle under the door just as the lifting crew was running out of gas. Kowalski was about to give the order to let the door down when Skara crawled back under the door. Get back here, growled Kowalski. But Skara might as well have been miles away. I can't hold it any longer, Ferretti grunted. Keep holding! No, I can't. It's too damn heavy. Keep holding! Kowalski's voice was steady, playing for time. Daniel and Shauri held their breath as the Horus guards slowly marched past them, then continued into the darkness of the room. Momentarily safe, Daniel sighed and put his arm around Shauri. Unbeknownst to either of them, a second Horus was creeping up from behind. Unlike the other attackers, this soldier was moving with a great deal of patience, careful to remain absolutely silent. He was close enough to get a good shot, but wanted to get right up behind them, certain of killing them before he fired. Slowly, he lifted the weapon and aimed for Daniel's blonde, disheveled hair. With a swift movement of his hand along the bottom of the rifle, he clicked it open. Daniel spun at the sound, but before he could react, there was a tremendous explosion from a pulse weapon. Unfortunately for the guard, it was not his weapon that had discharged. The explosion hit him from behind, rocketing him off his feet, twisting and turning him into the shadows. As the smoke dissipated, the image of O'Neill holding the pulse weapon appeared. It was the first time Daniel had ever been happy to see the soldier in the black beret. O'Neill put a finger up to his lips, telling them to keep quiet. As O'Neill stepped forward to confer with Daniel and Shauri, a scream came from the direction of the door. It was Skara shouting at the top of his lungs. O'Neill hit the ground before anyone could blink, and before the perfectly aimed projectile flashed out of the darkness, nearly taking his head with it. Skara had spotted the Horus lying in ambush near the cart, just in time. He had been guessing O'Neill, the dangerous one, would come to their rescue. Daniel and Shauri pulled off to one side as O'Neill rolled to another, and while the shots had missed O'Neill, they sailed past him and hit into the large stone door above Skara. A second later, the door slammed closed with a thunderclap. Thinking Skara had been killed, a world of rage swelled through O'Neill. All the anger he'd never been able to vent when his own son had died in such a pitiful, useless way. Now he would make the Horus pay for the deaths of both boys. Firing madly, he went on the offensive, a kill-or-be-killed stratagem. The Horus, calm as swamp water, waited for his best shot. Twenty yards before O'Neill was on him, he took it. Whether by intuition or pure luck, O'Neill knew when the shot was coming and initiated his dive just before the weapon's sizzling white payload ripped toward him. The shot never got close, but it pinpointed his enemy's position, and as he rolled out of his controlled tumble, he blasted the hawk right between the eyes. 
His helmet slammed backward, pulling the rest of him along in a long, clattering skid into the shadows. Colonel, let's go! Daniel ran into the light. Shauri, holding a pistol Ferretti had kicked under the door, was a step behind him. The sight of them instantly reminded O'Neill where he was. Avenging Skara's death wasn't part of his mission. He tried to swallow his feelings and head for the Stargate, but he didn't get far. He turned back and waded into the shadows searching for the fallen Horus. When he found him, he knelt down, took a pistol out of his waistband, and pumped five slugs into the man's unarmored middle. All right, he said, coming back into the light. Let's roll. Outside, Kowalski looked like the sweatiest, angriest pediatrician in history. Holding the recently delivered Skara by one ankle, he lifted the spindly 14-year-old as high as he could until they were face to upside-down face. Don't do that again! Each word snapped at the kid like a verbal firecracker. The pulse blast had shattered the wooden plank Kowalski was using as a lever. Without his strength, the door came down in a hurry, but not before he'd grabbed Skara and yanked him outside in the nick of time. Still hanging by his heels, Skara pointed into the air and shouted, Udajit! Gliders. Like a pair of swooping condors, but several times more fleet, the twin aircraft shot away from the upper part of the pyramid before banking back toward the vulnerably positioned squad. Scatter! Scatter! Kowalski realized there were going to be casualties. While the brigade scrambled for cover, Kowalski put his back against the huge door and waved his arms to give the planes a better target. He was hoping to draw enough firepower to open a breach into the pyramid. The silent fighter jets each sent a spray of power bursts rocketing down at the platform, exploding close enough to shower Kowalski with stone shrapnel, but far enough to protect the integrity of the door. They knew what he wanted them to do. As the gliders banked away and began looping around for their next approach, Kowalski broke into a dead run for the obelisks. Two more! Take cover! Ferretti hollered the warning from a ditch he'd found along the edge of the ramp. Kowalski, hustling down the stone incline, looked over his shoulder. Sure enough, a third and fourth glider were scorching down from the opposite side of the mountainous structure. Capturing him in their sights, both pilots fired at once. As the twin power balls screamed a long trail through the sky, Kowalski veered and performed a full-speed swan dive into the dunes a second before a large section of the ramp was blown to smithereens. Thank <laughs> you.